The famous news anchor Tucker Carlson almost died in a plane crash, but the revelation is pretty profound. Let's listen. It's important to understand the moment that you're in, and it cuts against the very core of human nature to understand it because I am totally convinced at my age that denial is the most powerful of all human instincts. I'm serious. I mean, honestly, I was 22 years ago, next month, I was uh, in a plane that crashed, amazingly, in the Middle East, flying from Peshawar, Pakistan, the Khyber Pass was right after 9-11, I was going over to cover the Taliban, and something happened in the cargo hold, and we went down in a sand dune in Dubai. Obviously, I survived, but it was a Pakistan International Airways flight, and the thing that changed my life about that experience was, something happened horrible to the plane, like there was an explosion in the cargo hold, some debate about what it was, but it happened, and the plane starts dropping, and the wing appears to detach, the right wing and the plane is like struggling for altitude and going up gunning the engines and sideways it's like three in the morning over the arabian sea people are freaking out on the plane every person on that plane thought we we're gonna die very much including me i had three little kids i was half drunk which makes it worse and we finally come in kind of sideways into the sand and the plane's on its side and i'm in the first seat on the plane it's a big double airbus and i just had one thought which is, i'm getting off the plane and it's you know totally dark and you can see burning from the wing so it's like it is time to depart the plane so i hop up and this male flight attendant stands right in front of me goes sit down everything is fine everything is fine that's a verb and a quote everything is fine it was so demonst demonstrably unfine I, I can't even begin to describe how unfine it was and i think just out of pure panic i like ignored the guy and i opened the door and the slide went up and i jumped into darkness with like four other westerners in the front everyone in the back though they were like oh everything's fine and i thought i've brooded on that for over 20 years like why did he claim everything was fine the pilots by the way went right out the front windows well they did oh absolutely like whatever good luck guys um, and I think he just couldn't metabolize the chain. It was so awful. He just could not admit what was happening right there in front of everybody. And this really bothered me all these years, despite the fact it wound up fine for me. First off, can you imagine being on a plane in the darkness and there's an explosion and one of the wings is dislocated from the plane itself. You're not in your own country. You don't know who's flying the plane. I mean, think about what would be going through your head in that situation. I'm curious about the other people on that plane. He's in Pakistan, so I'm assuming most are maybe Muslim. Real quick, there was a story of John Wesley on this ship with a bunch of Moravians and they're going either to the States or to Britain and the ship is going down and people are freaking out. John Wesley's freaking out and he sees this great group of Moravians and they're just worshiping the Lord. They look happy. They look filled with authentic joy. And John Wesley's basically like, what's going on? Like, how in the world are you guys okay? Like, we're all going to die. And they're just beaming. And they basically tell him, we have faith in God. No matter what happens, we have faith in the Lord. That'd be such a testimony if Tucker was filled with faith and joy in the Lord and just begins to speak to the other Muslims on the plane. In fact, it wound up fine for me. By the way, the plane is now a dive site off the Burj Hotel in, in uh, Dubai. You can swim through it, someday I will. Um, but then last year I read the biography, which I would recommend to everyone in this room, of Peter Rangel, who was the leader of the revolutionary r white forces during the Russian Revolution, um, the Civil War rather, that came after the revolution. And he was a Baltic German living in Russia and a, a general worked the czar. The war ends or Russia ceases its hostilities with Germany. He comes back to, to St. Petersburg and the country's in complete chaos. And the Bolsheviks have decided that, you know, it's the discontent within the army that we need to inflame and we need to get the army. I don't know if this sounds familiar to anyone here, uh, but get the guns and the people who wield the guns. We need them. So the first thing they do is destroy all discipline in the czar's army, complete. So Peter Rangel's just been on the front for four years. He comes back into St. Petersburg, totally civilized city, two-hour drive from Helsinki. I mean, it is Europe, okay? Whatever anyone tells you. And he's wandering through, and soldiers are going crazy in the streets. And they're raping women. They're stealing at gunpoint. Soldiers in uniform, in a monarchy, which had not had any behavior like this at all. And he, Peter Engel just can't even believe it. These are his soldiers. He's a general. And so he's he's completely freaked out, and he goes into a movie theater. And everyone in the movie theater is completely absorbed in the movie. Like, there's no revolution happening outside. And Peter Engel thinks, these people are insane. So he goes back. He's like, I gotta get to Moscow. So he takes the train to Moscow. I have to tell the czar, this country's falling apart. He's very close to the Romanovs, the family. You should read this. It's it's just out in English translation in the last three years. Unbelievable book, lost to history until recently, to English speak. So he goes back to Moscow, and he's close to the Romanov. And so he goes into the imperial court, and he knows all the relatives, and there are millions of them hangers-on. And he notices about 80% of the women in the Romanov family are wearing red ribbon in solidarity with the Bolsheviks who wound up, of course we know how it ends, murdering them, murdering them in the basement at dawn. So 
Wait, what? Peter Rangel says, how is it that this country is being devoured by a violent revolution and the people who can afford movie tickets, that is kind of our middle class, are refusing even to acknowledge that it's happening and the ruling class against whom it is aimed are sympathizing with it. And if this doesn't remind you of BLM, I don't know what does. I'm reading this in my porch. Like, man, I couldn't go to sleep. I was like, wait, I live in that country. That's happening now. This is a revolution. Its aim is to hurt you. Yes, that would include physically. Now, there's so many parallels we can pull from that story. What he just shared about Russia and that time period. But there is a multitude of people right now, just like that flight attendant, just like those people in the movie theater, that are refusing to admit that something is wrong in the world, that the world is on fire. I spent a lot of time on the streets preaching the gospel to tens of thousands of people. And I experienced so much resistance of people basically saying, chill out, man, like shut up. Everything's fine. No, there is no hell. There is no Satan. There is no Jesus. Just cool out, man. Just like that flight attendant, just like those people in the movie theater, unwilling to see the reality that there's fire, that there's sin, that there's evil, and that there's wickedness. And God's looking at us as his people and asking us the question, are you going to do the same thing? Are you just going to sit there while this world goes to hell? Are you just going to sit back and watch Netflix while the plane is on fire? Look, I get it. We get to have time to chill and to relax, time to rest and be with our families. But at the same time, we're at war against the kingdom of darkness and evil. And souls are on the way to hell. Jesus himself said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There is a multitude of opportunity of people being saved and coming to God, but the workers to bring them in are are so few. Oh, my heart burns for the people of God to just wake up and go and do something for the Lord and not let all this other stuff get in the way because one person can change the whole world. One person can change a culture or a society. And what if that one person is you and all the forces of hell are just trying to keep you in that movie theater, keep you on that plane, keep you paralyzed or terrified with fear, right? On that plane, there were people that were terrified with fear so much so they wouldn't leave. And then another group that thought everything was fine. But Tucker's like, I'm leaving, man. I'm out of here. That general who's seen the soldiers doing these wicked things and people in the movie theater is like, I'm going to go do something. I'm going to go talk to the head people because something's wrong here. Guys, if you believe something's wrong here, you have an obligation to do something about it. Even if that means you go on your knees in prayer, you begin to fast, you begin to preach on social media, you begin to go talk to your co-workers and your classmates about Jesus, we have to do something. If we are the people of God, we are called to do something. No matter who you are, you have a responsibility. But for many people, you don't know what to do. So I encourage you, click on this video and get some edification, get some wisdom, get some direction direction because I'm making these videos for you to edify you, to bless you, and to prepare you for the coming of the Lord Jesus. God bless you.